benchmarks are a great way to compare the performance of different computers and components. If you go and watch a review of a new laptop or a graphics card on YouTube, you can pretty much guarantee that the reviewer is going to be using benchmarks in order to draw conclusions. And that's fine, provided that we understand the limitations of benchmarks and then explain those to our viewers. Because the simple truth is that benchmark numbers don't always represent real-world experiences. So if you make a purchasing decision based solely on the benchmarks, you might end up with the wrong system for you. So in this quick video, let me just try and explain those limitations so that you can make informed purchasing decisions. And we'll start with the ubiquitous Geekbench 6 CPU test. Now this is a great benchmark for comparing the performance of different computer processors. There's a whole suite of different tests that are designed to represent a typical workflow. Great. But what are these different tests? Well, if we look at the detail behind the Geekbench CPU score, we can see those individual results. And we've got things like file compression, HTML5 browsing, photo library, and PDF rendering. And those will likely be part of every user's workflow but some of the tests are more focused. We've got a navigation test, which assesses the ability of the CPU to generate directions between a sequence of locations. And that's really useful for evaluating a smartphone, but perhaps less relevant to a desktop computer. We've also got tests for the Clang compiler, text processing and asset compression, things that would be very typical for a software developer's workflow, but not necessarily your workflow. And there are machine learning and image editing workloads, things like object detection, background blur, object removal, horizon detection, photo filters, and HDR photo blending. And if you're someone who spends a lot of time editing images, then those tests will be relevant to you. And finally, we can also see there are some 3D graphics tests like ray tracing and structure from motion, which might be relevant to your work if, say, you're a 3D artist using CPU rather than GPU for rendering. So not all of these tests will be applicable to your specific workload, but it's all of these individual scores blended together that create the final overall score. So perhaps you can see the problem already with only using that overall score to make a purchasing decision. And it could be that system A has a higher overall score than system B, but perhaps system B is actually better at the things you do on a daily basis. So these fine details are really important to consider, especially when you're comparing two different architectures. For example, Apple Silicon Macs with Intel PCs. But here's another issue. It's often the multi-core score that's used to compare the speed difference of two processors. So for example, let's take the newly released M3 Max, which scores 21,067, whereas the previous M2 Max scores 14,786, and that's a huge leap forward in performance. So a tech reviewer might do a graph of both of those scores and then point out that the M3 Max is 42% more performant than the M2 Max. And that would be a true statement. But do you need to rush out to upgrade? What you need to know here is that the benchmark test is designed to fully utilize every processor core. Now we can see this really clearly in the Cinebench rendering benchmark. Here, for example, we'll run the test on a modern PC notebook with a 12th generation Intel i7, and the performance is pretty good. This CPU is interesting because it has two different types of cores. You've got two high-performance dual-threaded cores and eight power-efficient single-threaded cores, but the test makes the most of all of those cores to deliver the best possible result. Now let's run the test on my workstation, which has a 32-core, 64-thread AMD Threadripper Pro CPU. As expected, the test runs significantly quicker because, again, it can make use of all of that performance. If we only look at the final scores and that huge performance difference, we might assume that the workstation is going to be vastly quicker than the notebook in all areas. And we'd be wrong, because in actual fact, there are a number of day-to-day -day tasks that will run faster on the notebook. Why? Because this efficient use of all of the cores doesn't happen automatically. The software has to be written in such a way so as to split the work into threads that can be distributed across all of the cores. Cinebench is obviously written in a way to do that, but not all software is written that way. In fact, not all software could be written that way, because there are some tasks that you just can't break apart like this. Now, it may be that a software application can be threaded across just four cores. And if that's the case, having a 32-core CPU isn't really going to make any difference to that piece of software. 
In fact, a processor with six or eight cores might actually be considerably quicker for that particular task. It's also true that your operating system will be able to multitask more efficiently by using additional cores to run software apps concurrently. So for some users, having more cores is beneficial, even if the individual software packages can't use all the performance. Now just come back to the M3 Max and M2 Max chips. Yes, the M3 Max has 42% more peak performance, and it's certainly true to say that, but we need to moderate our expectations with reality, because it's likely that we won't see those gains in real-world performance. Many apps actually rely on single-threaded performance, so a faster single-core score might actually be more important than the multi-core score. For example, web browsing or working in a spreadsheet. Let me highlight one more area where benchmarks don't tell the full story, and that's with optimizations. Uh, benchmarks, they're normally a measurement of raw performance in ideal circumstances, but they don't always factor in other benefits. Let me give you two examples. Uh, if you measure the raw computational performance of the Apple Silicon GPUs, you'll look on the rankings list and you can see that there are PC graphics cards that score much higher. But the Apple Silicon chips have optimizations that allow them to perform better than expected in the real world. And that's something that the raw benchmark tests don't always factor in. Take Apple's unified memory architecture. It allows the GPU to access the exact same memory space as the CPU, avoiding unnecessary data copying. But it also allows the GPU to access all of the available memory in the system. This notebook's got 32 gigabytes, and in theory the GPU can access as much of that as it needs. And that gives it a huge advantage in things like video rendering. It is true that you can go and buy a, a PC notebook with a much more powerful graphics card in it, but it will also have its own dedicated RAM, perhaps eight gigabytes. So for the most part, the PC would be faster and would score higher until you need to do a video render that requires more than that eight gigs of video RAM. Then the Mac that can access more memory can do it faster. Now let me give you a second example. I recently upgraded my PC workstation with an RTX 4090 GPU, and the performance is incredible. If you put it side by side with even the most powerful Apple Silicon Mac, I'd expect the RTX 4090 to win pretty much everywhere. However, the Apple Silicon chips have got really great video accelerators, and these close the gap much more than the benchmark numbers would suggest. When editing video with multiple streams of 6K RAW, our M2 Max notebook is able to get close to the experience of the PC. But throw in some heavily compressed HEVC 10-bit content, and the M2 Max starts to offer an identical, if not slightly smoother, experience than the PC with the 4090. But if we then throw some 10-bit 422 content into the mix, the M2 Max notebook destroys the 4090 equipped PC. Why? Well, it's nothing to do with graphics power and everything to do with these custom accelerator chips, because Apple Silicon has accelerator chips that can decode and encode 10-bit 422 content. Normally in a PC, this would be handed off to a custom accelerator in the CPU, and recent Intel chips have accelerators for exactly this type of content. But my AMD Threadripper Pro doesn't. So the result is that this top-of-the-line, very expensive PC that has all the great benchmark numbers slows to an impossible crawl, while something with lower benchmark numbers actually wins. Now just to be clear here, I'm highlighting a niche case, and I'm not saying that Macs are better than PCs. I edit the majority of my videos on that workstation, and I love it. I wouldn't change it. But I also won't be using it if I ever need to work with 10-bit 422 video content. So benchmarks are great, and we absolutely need to use them, but they can also be misleading if you don't understand how they apply to your specific workflow. There's no need to upgrade your machine every moment some new piece of hardware comes out with a higher benchmark score, because the reality is you might not even notice the difference. So it's really important to do your research and to seek a blend of opinions before you take the plunge. As always, I'm looking forward to your views and comments. Thanks for supporting the channel. See you again soon for some more geekery.